Firefly is a science fiction western, two genres that don't seem like they should go together, but often do for some reason. Westworld, TNG's A Fistful of Data's, Red Dwarf's Gunman of the Apocalypse spring immediately to mind. Probably because the Old West carries a romanticism, not unlike a Harley Davidson in an open road. It's the story of a place and a man, neither of whom can be tamed, which speaks even to the most urban and civilized of us of total freedom. Combined with the openness of science fiction, and there's room to take the old yarn to entirely new places and battle on new frontiers. I've already got mine figured out. Listen to this. Duke Neutron, time-traveling cowboy detective. Huh? Huh? Firefly's a classic example of being screwed over by the network, as any fan will tell you. Hopefully those executives have been fired, beaten up, and ground into a powder. We're following the crew of the Firefly-class ship Serenity, run by ex-rebels, fugitives, and criminals, all engaging in everything from mercenary work to smuggling to robbery, whatever it takes to survive out here on the frontier, away from the hands of the Alliance. But they're a plucky bunch, and they even do the right thing sometimes, so we love them. Let's start with the guy who titles this episode, the man they call Jane. You can see the high regard he has from the ship's doctor, Simon. You're like a trained ape, without the training. He and Mal, the captain and owner of Serenity, argue over this gun because there's no guns allowed where they're going, and it'd be nice if a deal went off without a hitch. You know, just to see what that would be like for once, kind of shake things up a little bit. Hating the Alliance adds problems on top of the whole stealing-smuggling thing, and Mal has this habit of doing the right thing, no matter how much that might piss him off. Jane's a little paranoid because he pulled a job here a few years back and is worried that might come back to haunt him. Enemies? You? No, how can it be? The thing about Jane is, he's a simple man. Now you only gotta scare him. Pain is scary, just do it right. He's a bit on the thuggish side, certainly. You know, I walk just as easy to lead him. I like smacking him. And he's really only working for Mal because no one's made him a better offer yet. But the thing about Jane is that, even his dumb, untrustworthy muscle, there's still a bit of complexity to his simplicity. This episode is one example of where we see that. And it's not because of his taste in clothes, I assure you. Janestown was written by Ben Edlund, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it might be because he's doing Supernatural, did some work on Angel, but mostly for creating The Tick, popular animated series, cult live action show, and indie comic book published by New England Comics. They sent me most of those when I used to do comic book reviews before the company I worked for switched to making pens or something, I don't remember, but books are still good. Huh, I'll have to send them my work on Duke Neutron. Anyway, they're smuggling stuff off this world, so they need to pose as customers, with Simon as the buyer. Uh, you have the right catalyst, you kill it proper. <laughs> this stuff's ten times stronger than steel, and half the way. Yes. Uh, I've, I've heard great... Uh, uh, what happened to Simon? I miss this diabolical master of disguise. But as much fun as Simon is, everyone's having fun at Jane's expense. <laughs> like they'd remember him here. But then again... Seems like wanted posters would be a lot easier than this. Seriously, though, erecting a statue to Jane is like erecting a statue to henchman number three. You're unlikely to notice him, and even if you do, it's not the kind of thing you'd normally want to remember. This must be what going mad feels like. They decide to head to the tavern for some drinks. Mutter's milk. Uh, basically beer with ass as the main ingredient. As they down their swill, they make contact and discuss how to get the goods. But the most important thing to do is to keep a low profile. James, the man they call James. Basically, do anything that you can to avoid attracting attention to yourself. Like, for example, it's probably not a good idea to bring along your personal bard. He robbed from the rich and he gave to the poor. Stood up to the man and he gave him what for. Our love for him now ain't hard to explain. The hero of Canton, the man they call James. Now we know why he was wearing that disguise. He had to protect himself from his fans. No, this must be what going mad feels like. Seems that Jane pulled a robbery here last time. When his bird was losing altitude, he had to dump the money. It landed amongst the mutters, who assumed he did it on purpose because he saw how much their lives sucked and how much they were getting ripped off. Now he's a folk hero to them and wanted by the magistrate not just for taking the money, but embarrassing him in front of the mutters. 
Still, this can all work out really. Just lie low, try not to get anyone's attention. Just keep from getting noticed and all your problems will be over. While this has been going on, Simon's sister, River, has been in the care of Shepard, very probably a holy man. They're two of the most enigmatic characters on board, with questions on whether anything he said is true or what his background really is, while River is a bucket full of crazy topped with too much brains and a problem with impulse control. They'd had a minor problem earlier when she tried rewriting his Bible because she said it didn't make sense. Oh, try to get to the part where the angels have sex with women to produce giants so that God could see if they could swim. It seems that letting his hair down creates a whole new series of problems. River? River, come back! Preacher, what the hell did you sick of? Whoa! We don't need another hero! But the mutters do, who are toasting to their folk hero, and who suddenly seems to start liking this. None of their good deeds up until now have really worked out too well. It's been more of a karma thing. Well, theoretically, since their karma actually seems to be kind of crappy. But this is the first time Jane's been looked at as a hero, and the surprising thing is that he doesn't seem to be trying to play these people over it. He knows he didn't do what he did out of altruism, but he doesn't play the act up either, just singing the folk song and enjoying the whiskey and the girls, but not looking for a way to take advantage of these people. In fact, he's actually kind of bothered that Mal plans to use this as a distraction to help him with the smuggling. That's why I say there's a bit of complexity to his simplicity. He's a man who really wants nothing more than what he has here. A good drink, a good song, and a beautiful girl. And he sees no reason to sully that by trying to twist it into getting even more. Life's given him something good, and he's not going to spoil it this time. And then, when we put that statue of you in Town Square, he rolled in, wanted to tear it down, but the whole town rioted. You guys had a riot? On account of me? <laughs> My very own riot? There's a second plot involving a Nara, who isn't a member of the crew exactly. She rents one of the shuttles, lives there, and uses it for her business. She's a companion, which is kind of like a prostitute, but more high class, um, maybe a geisha sort of thing. I mean, she's like an escort who actually does the escorting as well as the sex. At the moment, she's here to see the magistrate's son, who is 26 and still a virgin. And since there's no LARPing on this moon, she'll be sorting out that problem for him with her usual half-therapist, half-philosopher, all-queen-of-sexual-ecstasy kind of way. Speaking of being royally screwed, Jane's old partner, Stitch, has spent the last four years in a hot box and lost an eye when Jane shoved him out of that craft. The magistrate lets Stitch loose knowing that he'll unleash his rage on his partner. Jane, not Lilo. But Jane's really become taken with this place now. The fact that he changed all these people's lives for the better, even if it was just a little bit of money and some hope that someone actually cared about them. The mothers, I think I really made a difference in their lives. No. Me, Jane Cobb. I know your name, Jackass. You... Even the magistrate's son knows about him and admires him. So he's real disappointed that his father's locked down serenity so that it can't leave and Stitch can make mincemeat out of him. Presumably at Anara's prompting, the magistrate's son has the lockdown lifted, since he's now a man and can stand up for himself. But first it's time to mince Simon, who was left in the tavern and thus gets a severe ass-kicking from Stitch. This bothers Kaylee because the only reason he was there was because she dragged him along and then forced him to stay there rather than finish off the smuggling because he said something that she didn't like. Kaylee and Simon have a romantic relationship that's it's like trying to start an old car in winter. Every time you think it's going to catch, it just dies. Stitch has interrupted Jane's speech to the mutters and tells them what really happened, but one of them still takes a shotgun blast meant for Jane. And this, oddly enough, is one of those rare times we see Jane completely lose his shit. He's gotten pissed before, certainly, but here he grabs Stitch and beats him to death with his bare hands, because that mutter had believed in a lie so much he couldn't let anything happen to a hero even a hero who had never deliberately done anything heroic in his life. We had a good laugh before at Jane's rather lame speech, but now he gives another short and simple one, which sums up his view of life. You think there's someone just gonna drop money on you? Money they can use? Well, there ain't people like that. There's just people like me. 
Jane topples the statue, but back on Serenity, he says with frustration that the mutters are so desperate to make him a hero, they're probably putting it right back up again. But as Mal succinctly observes, that's the point, what the point of it always was. It was never about Jane, it was about them. The message suddenly ties back in with uh, what happened between Shepard and River when she was fixing his Bible. She had said, it doesn't make sense. And Jane closes by describing the situation with the mutters as, don't make no sense. She was insisting all the facts were wrong and they needed to be corrected. But Shepard insisted that wasn't what it was about. It was about believing, letting that belief change your life. It's about faith. You don't fix faith, River. It fixes you. It wasn't about Jane. It was the idea of Jane that had mattered to the mutters, so much that they were prepared to die for it. As the one who took the shot for Jane had told him earlier, when the mutters are united against the magistrate, he can't force them to do anything. This is part of an allegory for the mutters and the mud they work, which was established upon meeting the foreman. The mud is actually a clay, as in the common clay, and he says that with the right chemicals added, it'll make the finished product 20 times stronger than steel. Jane was what they needed to become as strong as they needed to be. It can be argued that rating Firefly is kind of pointless since there are only 14 episodes and all of them with their own charm. I will say that this one, though, compared to other Firefly, has far less action adventure and far more comedy. But like all of them, it helps develop the characters and it really is amazing how alive the people become in a series that's as short as this one. As a result, I'm giving this a stamp of recommended. The thing about Firefly is that it prefers to show rather than tell, which is good but can lend itself to some head-scratching moments, like the nature of the area of space that they call the verse. It was clearer once the movie came out. Discussing the blend of science fiction with Western to create a consistent yet plausible universe would be a video all to itself, so that's why I'm not addressing things that might otherwise be unusual or confusing that might make more sense in the greater mythology of the show, or the ideas behind it. The Alliance isn't a united federation of planets, it's more of a Rome that doesn't seem to know or care what the distant people are up to, so long as they do as they're told for the most part. But getting back to the episode specifically, the way that the characters are here developed shows how beneficial Janestown was for the series, not to mention the fact that it served as a sort of a stopover point, a chance for the audience to catch their breath in the development of the series. We had a chance to kick back a little bit and laugh some, and yet get to know these people better, in anticipation of the bigger things that were to come soon. Crappy town where I'm a hero. And they call Jane. 